Greetings from Bethel Memorial Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Brent Robinson. Today is the first Sunday of March and we are having our annual meeting. We bumped it one week because of all the challenges of getting everything done in time. And uh, as I look through those uh, reports, it's hard, it's hard to look back over a year. Next week marks the year that everything locked down. And as you consider that, you need to think, how have I responded to all of these things? Some people respond in complete defiance. No one's going to tell me. The government's not going to tell me what I cannot and cannot do, what I have to do. They're, they're not going to do that. Others are in complete surrender to whatever anybody asks of them, the mask police and the authorities. I, I, again, to the first extreme, one church I talked with, I said, how are things at your churches? Well, we don't really know. Because if somebody gets sick, we don't even bother to get tested. We're just not interested. We're kind of denying it. To, you know, well, that's hard when you know somebody who's gotten sick and even died from it. But that, that's their choice. Uh, and then complete surrender. That's like they're just afraid that we'll, we'll do something wrong. And, and just whoever says something, we're going to capitulate. Hopefully there's a middle ground and you can be guided by the wisdom of God through all of these things. It takes wisdom and discernment to navigate those challenges. Now, as I read through the reports, I realized no one feels that we've done this perfectly, and that's accurate. We haven't done this perfectly, but we persevered. We didn't give up. We kept moving toward uh, answers to the, the challenges that we had, looking for solutions. We continued to improve, and we adjusted our responses as we needed to, hopefully following the Lord's will for our church and our lives. Well, that leads us to our theme today. Walking in wisdom. We've been looking at different ways that we walk in the second half of the book of Ephesians, the, the last three chapters. Uh, walking, the first three chapters were the calling of the church, the last three chapters of the conduct of the church. So we've looked at walking in unity, walking in holiness, walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom is where we are today. Now, we said last week, unity is not possible unless we have an agreed upon standard of light. That's the holiness. So to walk in unity, we have to be, be walking in holiness and God's standard of holiness. Holiness is, is not possible without God's love. And God's love is given to us so that we can love one another. Love and forgiveness needs to be received and it needs to be extended to others. As we see that uh, unity, holiness, and love, we recognize we have to walk in his light so that we can continue to pursue those things and walk in them. And as God shines his light in our lives, we can grow in wisdom. We can develop a wisdom and light from his spirit. Uh, he's shining, he's guiding it, and we learn lessons and we grow in wisdom. And that's my proposition today is we are called to walk wisely. Let me open up in a word of prayer before we look into the passage. I thank you, Father. I thank you for your love and your care. I thank you for your standard of holiness. I thank you for the call to unity. I thank you for the light of your word and your spirit in our lives. And I thank you for the gift of wisdom. And I pray that we can learn more about it today. I pray that you'll bless, bless us as we look into your word. Have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say will hinder your message. Let your spirit be free to move in our hearts as we look into your word. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. We are called to walk wisely. Beginning in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 5 of Ephesians, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Now, I've called this walk wisely each day. I think a day is a good amount of time to consider. You can say, oh, I got to keep every thought captive. I need to, to take every second captive. No, that, that, that stresses me out. What about every minute, you know, every 60 seconds? No. What about every hour? It's good to sit down every hour. Well, sometimes the hours pass. We, I think the day is a, is, a, is a good sense of what we need to commit to the Lord each day. It will involve our hours and minutes and seconds. But think about each day. Don't get beyond that with weeks and, and uh, months and years. Thinking about the year ahead. We don't know what's going to happen. Let's focus on each day. Let's walk wisely each day. Verse 15 says, look carefully then how you walk. Now, different translations put those that word order differently. 
And the key is, what does the word careful, it's, a, it's, a, it's an adverb, what does it really modify? Is it, the, is it the looking or is it the walking? And this is kind of important. In the Greek, the word look is never modified this way. That the idea is, is to take look, to look at things so that you can walk carefully. So it's carefully walk, not carefully look. And why do I say that? Because you can spend so much time looking that you never get into the actual walking. That we, we can overthink things and we should be careful not to do that. We need to look. We don't have to look, 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 look. If you've heard the illustration about the football team that did a great job studying the playbook. Every day they'd get together and they'd study the playbook and they never went out and played a game. That's not what we're here for. We're to walk wisely. We need to look, but we need to carefully walk. That's the, the first thought there. And then it says in verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Making the best use of the time. Some passages, uh, translations say redeeming the time. To redeem something is to spend, you know, to, to pay some money for, to redeem. How do you spend your day? How do you spend your time? I, I thought of so many ways to, to do this. I, be efficient, be industrious, be productive, be fruitful. And I, there, there was something I didn't like about each one of those. And then finally, when I was studying something else, all of a sudden it hit me. Be disciplined. Be disciplined in the use of your time. Think about how you spend your time. You've heard that question. What if today were the last day of your life here on earth? How would you live it? And I have heard about the song Tim McGraw wrote called Live Like You Were Dying, where he meets a man who knows that he's dying. And he said, she said, I pray that everyone gets a chance to live like they were dying, that they really focus on what it is that they're doing for, for that day. How do you spend your time to think about spending it wisely and letting God take each day of your life? Then we're also called to be different. The days are evil. The days are evil. Uh, this weekend, Friends of Israel has been doing a teaching on the book of Revelation, eight sessions, and it's been fun. You can look it up on their website. I think it'll be up until March 20th or 21st. Just an opportunity to study a book that everybody's thinking about, wondering, are we in the end times and all those things. But one of the things they talked about, there are two witnesses that are given by God to the, to the rebellious world to preach uh, repentance and say, turn back to God. Well, after their ministry, they are killed. And it says that the whole world rejoiced at their death. They gave gifts to one another in celebration. It's like they, they made a whole new Christmas holiday uh, about the death of these two prophets of God. It just astounded me when I heard it, that, that, that the world is evil. So we are called to be different from the world. We have to be careful and that we walk wisely. We need to be disciplined in how we use our time. We need to know that we're going to be different from the world. That's how we walk wisely each day. That's a tremendous challenge. We need to, again, thinking about don't get overhead, get ahead of yourself. Just think, Lord, every day I want to get up and commit that day to you. There's one other thought when I talked about redeeming, thinking about redeeming the time. What about my choice to rest? I just started exercising again in the pool. And, and as I think about exercise, I had a roommate in college that was a wrestler. He said, you need to work your muscles and then you need to rest them. If you do a, a weightlifting thing, it's good to give a whole day in between to let them catch up and rebuild. And so rest is important. So if I'm sitting down doing something mindlessly that doesn't seem productive, doesn't seem efficient, doesn't seem to be very disciplined, is that okay? Yes, it's okay, but don't let it take over. If you just let life bounce around, you know, rest is important. And it, you can sit down and play a game on your phone. But if you look up two hours later, say, what happened in that two hours? Put a limit on your time. Be disciplined when you choose to do something, whether you like to get out and, and golf. And there's you know, certain things that seem more redeemable, redeeming in their effect on our lives, but it doesn't just be disciplined in that so that we can be different and walk a careful life before the Lord. The next two verses, 17 and 18 says, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. First thing I see here is we are not to be foolish. Don't be foolish. The website Bible.org had a had a uh, article about the characteristics of the a foolish man in the book of Proverbs. And I'll just read through those quickly. Unrighteous. They don't care about what's right and wrong. They just want to live their life the way they feel. They're unwise. Again, they're not disciplined. They are not careful. They don't care about anything. They just bounce through life in a foolish manner. Unrealistic. They may say, oh, I'll be able to do this, 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 and this. And then everything falls apart. And they don't learn from those lessons. Undisciplined, that's a, really the same idea of unwise. Unreliable, you can't trust them. If we talk about sending a message by the hand to, with the hand of a fool, is just like you know, hurting your foot, cutting your foot off. Or I don't remember the exact phrase, but, but it's, it's foolish to trust a fool because they're unreliable. And the reason they stay foolish is because they're unteachable. I'm fine the way I am. That's just who I am. They're not willing to learn. They're not willing to, to seek to grow. And in that stubbornness, they are actually unpleasant. They don't realize how they come across to people, the foolish people. So don't be foolish. But then this next phrase, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't we all wish we could do that? What does it mean to understand what the, isn't that, that our daily define God's will for our life and go on and on? Well, as I was thinking about this, I want to share something that, I, uh, from a book I read in college, Gary Friesen, Decision Making in the Will of God. And it's just something that I keep coming back to in my life. You'll hear people say, I want to be in the center of God's will. I can't be more protected and, and, than if I'm in the center of God's will. Do you think the Old Testament Joseph was in the center of God's will? And look all the bad things that happened to him. See, we kind of want to, if I do the enough right things in, in the moral will of God and find that specific thing that I'm supposed to do, God will protect me from all bad things. He's never made that promise. So we see this moral will, which is God's revealed will for how we should live. Outside of the moral will is his sovereign will because he permits evil. But then we get fearful because we say, but there's this dot. I have to find out exactly what I'm supposed to do in this situation. And if I miss it, my life is a shambles. That's fearful living. And what Gary Friesen wanted to talk about was the fact that there's an area of freedom and responsibility within the moral will of God, that you, you apply God's moral will to how you are gonna live it out responsibly as an individual. It's your individual plan for God's life. And God cooperates with you. Again, I don't know how God's sovereignty and my responsibility go together, but it does. And he, give, he calls me to things. And even if I make a bad decision, his will does not end for me. He, he allows for repentance and he can move me. He knew that bad decision would be made. So there's a freedom to following God's moral will. We've already heard that too. The kids playing in a, in, a, in a playground, when they put a fence up, they're willing to play right up against the fence. But if, it's, if there's not a fence, they sometimes stay more toward the middle. There's a sense of when, when you know what the limits are, there's a freedom there. That's the moral uh, versus the, the sovereign will that allows you to do evil. But within that, there's this area of freedom and responsibility that you can trust God. If, you're, if you make a decision and it's, he wants to guide you another way, he is able to do that. So when I read that phrase, understand what the will of the Lord is, just focus today on it's free. It's freeing. To walk in the will of God because the other things that the world is calling me to walk in or my flesh or the devil they will enslave me I want the freedom of God's will and then finally submit to the spirit do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery but be filled with the spirit you've heard this verse I'm sure in many ways it means what are you giving yourself to to be filled by something means to really be controlled by it. That there's not an area of my life that I'm holding back. I'm, I'm letting the spirit fill me. See, I can be filled with wine and get drunk and it impacts every aspect of my life. It's there as a comparison. This isn't about uh, not drinking. It's about not being drunk. It's using that as a comparison. No, they'll be drunk with things of this world. We be, be submitted to the spirit, filled with the spirit. And it doesn't have to be wine, obviously drugs, 
but it could be your entertainment choices. It could be your relationships. I, I need this relationship more than anything. And I'm, I'm not submitting to the spirit. I'm, I'm just filling myself with something else. Basically becomes idolatry. You're idolizing something or someone and, and you're not letting the spirit have his proper place. Um, Bob Dylan wrote a song, gotta serve someone, gotta serve somebody. You are going to be controlled by the things you give yourself to. So I wanna be controlled by the spirit. So I'm gonna submit to the spirit. Uh, Colossians 3.16, the companion passage to this passage in Ephesians uses the phrase, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's a good way to submit to the spirit. Let the spirit of God take the word of Christ and let it seep into my heart that I follow him as he guides me according to God's word. Walk wisely each day, walk wisely in God's will, walk wisely in worship. This is so important because we need to see God as bigger and bigger and bigger. We overestimate the evil and underestimate God. In our worship, we learn to, you can't overestimate God. You get a better picture of how powerful he is, how loving he is, how he is with you, all the things about God. We need to worship. So what does it say in verses 19 and 20? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this because it's talking about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Definitely music, right? But he says, addressing one another. Colossians 3.16 says, teaching and admonishing one another. Most translations in Ephesians say, speaking to one another. Don't worry about the music, but let the message of music be something you encourage one another with. Like, you know, if you ask people, do you feel comfortable with people hearing you sing? As a lot of people say, no. Well, that's not the issue. Speak to one another in these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Again, these are all musical terms. Psalms are divinely inspired songs of praise. They're the they're, they're scripture. They're inspired as scripture. Hymns are great, but they're not claiming the same inspiration. So there's something that also leads us to praise God and honor him and thank him. Many great songs. And then spiritual songs. Uh, the, the idea of songs that edify your spirit, that challenge you, that help you understand uh, more about God. I think about the, the fact that I like a lot of secular music. Uh, one of the things that happened in the pandemic, and people heard me talk about this, there's a Russian group called Leonid and Friends that does these uh, cover songs of the band Chicago. I grew up loving Chicago, trying to learn how to play drums like Danny Serafan. I tried to do all those things. Well, this, this Russian group, they just enjoy this music and they have all these YouTubes out there and it's just a blessing. Now, does it edify me spiritually? Not necessarily. Does it lead me away from God? No, it doesn't do that. There's room for secular music in your life, but here we're talking about worship. We don't need to bring that into the church. We don't need to bring that and in, 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 in not be thinking about when we take the time to worship as a group, we should be speaking to one another in songs that help us spiritually. Singing to the Lord in your heart. Thinking about that. Singing and making melodies to the Lord in your heart. Now that's where the music is. God hears the music of your heart. Well, I don't want people to hear me sing. Don't worry about that. Let your heart sing out to God. And I, I didn't focus on melody because sometimes we like harmonies as well. Uh, but that's where the, the, the worship and the fellowship of together in worship that we can harmonize with one another. There's just, just beautiful picture here. The goal is to see God. Don't worry about your musical talent or lack of musical talent. Just speak to one another, sing to God in your heart. And then this last verse, verse 20, this is a hard one. I don't like superlatives when they refer to things like this. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you thank God always for everything? Those that know me know that when I was in high school and responding to some of the angst as a teenager, I wrote a song, give thanks always for all things unto God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. 
See, I can know that my God is sovereign and can work things for his good. There was a great devotional in uh, Daily Bread this week. I think it was set in China about somebody said, oh, that's a blessing. And he said, well, maybe not. And then something bad happened. Uh, the, the one I can remember is that the son hurt his leg. Well, that's that's wrong. That's bad. Well, maybe maybe it's good. And when they came with the draft to, to bring people into the war, uh, his son was excused because he had hurt his leg. Well, that's a blessing. Well, maybe something else will happen. And it kind of went back and forth and back and forth. It's just understanding that God's in control. So we can thank God by faith for everything that comes our way. Changes our attitude. Changes our attitude. We learn to worship God. We learn to sing to him in our heart and speak to one another. We can encourage one another. We can learn to be thankful at all times for everything. Well, there's a lot there to think about regarding wisdom. But as I was wrapping up, I was thinking of these words that Jesus shared. And I'll just say this. Jesus has a wise plan for his followers. This is when he's sending out his disciples. And he says, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. As much as I've been thinking about creation with all the snow and all the blessings of the past couple of weeks and just thinking about creation, there are four animals here to think about. A sheep, a wolf, a serpent, a dove. Now, each of those animals bring to mind a lot of things. Let's focus on what Jesus was saying. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Let me just say this. Jesus knows where we are and who we are with. But Lord, you don't understand how bad he is, how bad she is, how bad they are. I'm sent to, I sent you there. I know where you are. And I know you're a sheep among wolves. Well, I don't want to be a sheep. I want to be a wolf. I want to bite back. I want to fight back. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Know that this is not by accident, that God is very aware. In our men's fellowship this week, someone said, God knows every person on the world in the world. Every person. And knows everything about them. I can't have a conversation with two people without getting confused. See, God is that awesome. So be comforted about that. And then, so be wise as serpents. I don't like serpents. I don't like snakes. This is March, uh, St. Patrick's Month. And uh, what he did with the snakes in, in, in Ireland, I read just briefly about that this morning. I can't really talk much about it except to know that it was a, something that was part of his life or the legend. I don't know. But we don't like snakes. We want to get, get them out of here. Well, don't worry about the snakes. Look at the word wisdom. We are called to avoid the snares set for us. Serpents are good at that, getting out of things. Uh, we are called to avoid the snares set for us and then be innocent as doves. We are called to serve the Lord blamelessly. See, in our response to the wolves, in our response to the evil of this world, we're not allowed to become evil. We're not supposed to answer foolishness according to its folly. We have to answer foolishness according to how it, its folly deserves. And we need to be innocent as doves. And I, if that doesn't clarify it, I love this last statement. Wisdom does not equal dishonesty. See, we think about serpents being liars and Satan being a serpent was the father of lies. But wisdom does not equal dishonesty. We can be wise. In, in, in avoiding the snares without being dishonest. And innocence does not equal gullibility. You catch yourself being gullible, we don't like that feeling. Well, doves, they're all about peace and harmony, but in an evil world, they get slaughtered. I don't wanna be slaughtered. Well, don't focus on that. Focus on the fact that innocence does not equal gullibility. We can be shrewd. We can be wise. We don't have to be dishonest. We don't have to be gullible. We just need to be uh, wise and innocent as we live amongst the wolves of this world. And remember, if Jesus calls us as sheep, who's the shepherd? And what's the shepherd's responsibility to protect us? The, the challenge that we have there is that do you feel prepared for the Do you feel prepared for the year ahead? How about the month or even just from now until Easter? The recognition that we don't have to live a week at a time. Some people get come to church and say, I'll get charged up and that'll last me for a week. 
No, we are called to live daily. We are called to live daily with the Lord. Remember to follow his call each day of your life and let him lead you one day at a time. Father, I thank you for this care and I ask that you would indeed bless us uh, to know that you want to give us wisdom. It's not something we work ourselves into. It's, it's following your light and following your love and following your holiness and, and the fellowship of, uh, in unity with other believers that we can learn to walk in wisdom. Help us to grow in that. Help us to know you better, to submit to the spirit so that we be filled with your wisdom and your fruit so that we can make a difference and redeem the time that we have. And now may you be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen and God bless.